Right, well, good evening, everybody. This is my planetarium show for August of 2020. And it's been produced using some software called Stellarium that you can download from the internet. It's absolutely free and a wonderful way of learning about the night sky. So I've switched over here to 9.30 p.m. and the sun is beginning to set. And what we're going to do is run time forwards and we'll see the sun sink down below the horizon and the sky get darker. Sky color begins to change to the familiar oranges and reds of sunset. There it goes down behind the tree, behind the horizon. The sky is getting darker. And as we get to 9.30 p.m., we should just begin to see a few stars starting to appear. So the first one we're going to look at is a very bright star called Arcturus. It's in the constellation of Butes the Herdsman, a, a one that you may not be familiar with, but very prominent in the uh, evening sky. And it's a red giant star. It's a little bit like the sun will be in seven billion years time. When it's run out of fuel and expanded. Now we're going to look down towards the south and get our last chance to catch the constellation of Scorpio. Uh, this is the scorpion and you can just see its uh, tentacles represented by the stick diagram there where its body is partly below the horizon. A bright star in the center of uh, Scorpio there is another of these red stars a very prominent one, this one, Antares. I'm going to zoom in on it. This is a red supergiant star. It's many times brighter than Arcturus in terms of its power output, but it's about 10 times as far away. So it looks equivalently bright to our eye. And uh, we always have to remember that just because something is bright, it doesn't necessarily mean it's powerful. It might be a nearby star. So that's Antares, the bright star in the constellation of Scorpio. So we're now going to let the sky properly darken and run time forward to 11 o'clock in the evening. As we do that, Scorpio will move and disappear there. The sky is darkened already will disappear down below the horizon. That was the International Space Station just whizzing across, doing a, a very low pass in the south. But slightly to the west of south, we have the moon here, and it's nearly showing full. This planetarium show is set for the 1st of August, but obviously as the month goes on, the moon will pass through full and then into the later parts of the sky and in the morning sky, uh, becoming a uh, a half and a crescent again over about the next 16 days. So that was the moon and next to it there are a couple of very bright objects there and of course we can also see the Milky Way. Milky Way runs through this constellation of Sagittarius and uh, it's just above the horizon. Now the stick diagram, I always say this makes it look more like a teapot to me. You can see that teapot shape but uh, the ancient people made out an archer uh, of a half man, half horse centaur, which is a very interesting way of putting the stars together. I can't really see that one myself. But lurking within this region is the thick star clouds of the Milky Way and lots of interesting objects. This is the Eagle Nebula with the familiar pillars of creation deep in the center there where new stars are being formed out of the collapsing clouds of gas and dust. This was famously photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's one of its iconic images. Just below that, we have the Swan Nebula. The very bright part is, is its wing, and then you can see that sort of S shape over to going to the left and then up where its head and its beak are supposed to be. This is another star forming region where clouds of gas are giving birth to new stars and star clusters. And yet another one, a little bit more evolved this time. This is the Lagoon Nebula. And you can see the star cluster has formed and is beginning to blow a bubble around itself and blow the rest of the material outwards away from the center. And that stops any more stars forming once it reaches a certain point. 
Here we have just next door the Triffid Nebula, where we have again the red colour of hydrogen gas and some dark dust lanes and a new star cluster emerging from its nebula. And also the blue colour there is the very strong blue uh, light bouncing back from a cloud of gas behind where one of the very hot young blue stars is uh, reflecting its light back to us. So we'll pull back away from the star clouds of Sagittarius a bit and uh, get the wide view and then we're going to have a look at some planets. They're just on the screen at the left there. We're going to take a look at the uh, planet Jupiter first, just above the moon on the 1st of August. Of course, the moon will move from night to night. So as we zoom into Jupiter, we see the disk of the planet with the familiar cloud belts. That's what you'll see with a rather small telescope. And of course, we've got three of its large moons out to the right there, Europa, Ganymede and Callista. You'll see those easily, even with binoculars. They're really quite bright. But with a more powerful telescope, we can zoom in even further and we'll zoom right in on the planet itself. Now we can clearly see the cloud belts and the great red spot, that giant hurricane that's been raging for over 400 years, first seen by Galileo, and lots of smaller spots, which are smaller storms. The little object out to the right there, the red one, is uh, one of Jupiter's small moons, Amalfia. And uh, what we're going to do now is let time click forward um, and you'll see the planet spin on its axis. It only takes about 10 or 11 hours to rotate around, despite being um, so large that a thousand Earths would fit inside Jupiter. So there we can run time forwards and the great red spot moves across. Uh, over to the left there, the moon Io that was hiding behind Jupiter has appeared and Europa is now about to go into eclipse. So when we started, we had Io hiding in the eclipse. Here it is, it's now come out of the shadow of Jupiter. And when we zoom right in on Io, you'll see the amazing colors of the landscape, the yellows, oranges, whites, and blacks. Those are all the colors of sulfur because Io is the most volcanic world we know. It's completely covered in those black dots are all volcanoes spewing sulfur across the surface. It's turning itself inside out. Now we'll pull back a little bit and go and have a look at Europa, the second moon, just before it disappears into eclipse. So we'll uh, zoom right in on Europa. And what we see here is an icy world covered in a layer of ice with some cracks and grooves running across it. And those cracks and grooves seem to be bringing darker material to the surface. We think there's an underneath the ice ocean about 100 kilometers deep and more water, liquid water, in that ocean than there are in all the oceans of the Earth. Here's the third moon of Jupiter called Ganymede and this is the largest moon in the solar system, bigger even than the planet Mercury. Covered in ice and a few craters, quite a mixed terrain. We think this too may have an icy ocean underneath and these icy oceans are quite strong candidates for harboring uh, extraterrestrial life, perhaps simple uh, organisms living in the water, kept warm by volcanic processes, or perhaps more complex creatures we need to go and explore. Now we're looking at Callisto, and Callisto is covered in craters with a much darker surface and orbits further away from Jupiter and doesn't seem to have that liquid ocean inside. It seems to be all frozen up. If you want to hear more about those, look for my talk, Fire and Ice, on YouTube, because that covers a lot of detail about the moons. So that was Jupiter. Just up and to the left, we have the planet Saturn. We'll go and have a look at that now, as it's so close. So we zoom in on Saturn, and you'll begin to see the uh, rings. This is what a small telescope would show the body of the planet and the rings, and perhaps even that dark gap between the A and the B ring. Also, you'll see a family of moons, Titan, Dione, Rhea, Tethys, Iapetus. It's easy to find about five of the moons with a moderate sized telescope. And the larger the scope is, the more moons you'll be able to track down because they range in brightness. 
If we zoom right in, you'll see the gorgeous disk of the planet, more subtle colours than Jupiter, but nevertheless, quite a lot of cloud belts. You'll see the shadow of the planet on the rings there, and you'll also see more detail about the uh, Cassini division, as it's called, the gap in the rings. Largest moon of Saturn is Titan, and a fascinating world it is in its own right. It has a thick atmosphere that we can't see through with ordinary telescopes, but uh, we have looked through that a little bit with infrared and with radar from the orbiter Cassini mission when that was still active, and indeed dropped a probe called Huygens down onto the surface, and revealed that it has weather and rain and frost and lakes, but these lakes are all made of liquid methane because it's so cold that far out in the solar system, all the water is frozen up. So now let's go and look at perhaps the most famous constellation in the northern sky, and that's the Great Bear, Ursa Major. It comprises the plough feature, the big dipper, plus the other bits which represent the head and paws of the bear. So there is the Great Bear. Rather low in the north at this time, uh, we're early hours of the morning at the moment, about 2 a.m., and uh, it's uh, quite low in the north, so it's not the best time to be looking for it, but it's always worth checking it out. In the tail, the middle star in the tail of the Great Bear, you can even with the naked eye see is a double star, the two components, Mizar and Alcor there. But with a telescope, we can zoom right in, all the way in on Mizar here, and Mizar reveals itself to be two separate components. We could also do that with Alcor, and we would find that too would be a double star. So this is a pair of double stars, a quadruple star system. That's the middle star in the tail of the Great Bear. And we can use that as a signpost, because if we just go up and left a bit, we find the pinwheel galaxy, Messier's object number 101 in his catalogue. Lovely spiral arms and the deep yellow colour of the nucleus showing there. Very easy object to find with a small telescope. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope view, a very detailed image showing those slightly irregular spiral arms. So we'll zoom back away from that and now we're going to drop down just below the tail of the Great Bear. There's Mizar and Alcor again, so we're just going to go the, almost the same distance but down to the uh, lower side of the tail, just here. We're going to zoom in on what looks like a star, but it turns out to be the Whirlpool galaxy and the bright nucleus of its smaller companion galaxy that it's currently consuming. It's gobbling it up with its gravity. And I love the colours in this image of the Whirlpool galaxy. The blue is hot uh, young stars that have recently been formed in the spiral arms. Also over in the Great Bear, we have a different type of object. We're going to slew across to the uh, right here and look just below the centre of the bowl of the uh, Great Bear, the bowl of the plough. And here we have the Owl Nebula, because it looks rather like the eyes and beak of an owl through a small telescope. But here we see it's an expanding smoke ring of uh, gas and dust that has been shed from the outer layers of a dying star. Our sun will form one of these structures called a planetary nebula. They're nothing to do with planets, they just looked a bit like planets with ancient telescopes. And just next door to the Owl Nebula, we have another galaxy. This is a spiral, but it's almost edge on to us and around 45 million light years away. So four times further away than the other two galaxies that we've looked at so far, that are fairly nearby at 10 million. This is 45 million. We'll pull back away from those objects and we'll go up above the bowl of the Big Dipper and find another pair of galaxies that are also quite close by, around about 10 or 11 million light years. In fact, you can see three galaxies here. There's a small one to the left, big one in the middle and one at the top. The large one in the centre is Bode's galaxy uh, and it's the main one of a small cluster of galaxies. Just above it is the Cigar Galaxy, and the Cigar Galaxy is, would you believe, it's a spiral galaxy, but about six million years ago, 
it had a near miss with its larger neighbor and it's disrupted it, twisted it, and caused a huge outburst of uh, material shooting out from the central region there, that red hydrogen gas color again. Lots of new stars being formed in the cigar galaxy as a result of all that turmoil. So now we've uh, looked at the great bear, we'll look at the little bear, Ursa Minor. This is just above it. And uh, here's the stick diagram showing a similar sort of plow-like structure. There's the little bear. And he has a very long tail. These bears definitely aren't anatomically correct. Bears have rather short tails and these bears have very long ones. But the tip of the tail of uh, Ursa Minor is very important to us astronomers. For and to navigators, it's the pole star, Polaris, the North Star, sits directly in line with the spin axis of the Earth. So it seems to stay still as we turn around it and always indicates North. I'll illustrate that because what we can do is run time forwards and as it does so, the sky rotates. You also see one or two satellites rudely zipping across our field of view. This is uh, when they're in polar orbits. They quite often pass by Polaris for obvious reasons, this being the north pole of the sky. So we're rotating around. The Polaris stays still. Everything else spins around it. Now we're going to run time back so that I uh, put time back to where it was at around 2.30 in the morning. And uh, Again, the satellites are now moving backwards. This Stellarium software knows all about things like the International Space Station and when you're going to be able to see it. And uh, it's very, very useful for planning, observing times and sessions. You can set the date and the time and see exactly what the sky is going to look like. Right, so we'll now move on and we'll move away from Ursa Minor and Ursa Major and have a look at some of the other constellations that are very prominent at this time of year. So I'll just zoom back out and then go and find the next target, which is the constellation of Hercules the hero. Very recognizable because these four stars in the center of the screen make up this keystone shape and then Hercules's arms and legs stick out from the four corners of the keystone. He's upside down as the graphic illustrates, and fighting with the multi-headed snake, the Hydra. But um, we'll take that away and we'll zoom in on perhaps my favourite object in this part of the sky. Two thirds of the way between the right hand stars of a keystone, just in here, there's a little object that easily found with binoculars, but a telescope reveals it better. It's the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules. It's about half a million stars packed tightly together in a little tiny ball of stars about a light year across, but just outside our galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy has about 400 of these so-called globular clusters orbiting around it. Here's another one. This is uh, just uh, a little bit further um, north in the sky than uh, the first one. 26,700 light years away, just outside the disk of the Milky Way, a bit smaller. Here's a high resolution telescope view of it from Hubble. Very nice objects to look at with the telescope because uh, they sit nicely against the blackness of their surroundings. Um, very lovely objects to look at. They look like uh, jewels, diamonds scattered on a velvet sky. Next door to Hercules, we have the next constellation. It's called Lyra, named after a Greek musical instrument. It's a parallelogram of stars next to one bright star called Vega. And uh, they managed to make this in their imagination into this particular musical instrument. I find that a little bit of a stretch, but that's true for a lot of the constellations, actually. There was a, a lot of imagination used. So if you have a look and zoom in on Vega, it's a very bright star in our northern sky, but it, this is one that's bright because it's fairly nearby. 
It's only 25 light years away, which makes it one of the sun's near neighbors. It is hotter and brighter than the sun, um, about 9,000 degrees. Our sun is 5,800. And so Vega is putting out about 40 times as much light, but uh, it's also quite close to us. So that's the star Vega in the corner of uh, Lyra. Now we're gonna look down between the stars at the foot of Lyra and we find the Ring Nebula. Again, a lovely object to look at if you've got a reasonable telescope. This is another of these so-called planetary nebulae formed by a dying star. And you can see the dead nuclear core, the white dot in the center there, that's called a white dwarf star. It's the remains of the core of the star that's puffed off its outer layers. And these planetary nebulae are some of the most beautiful objects to look at in the sky. We've moved over to the constellation of Cygnus the Swan here. You just about see the wings stretched out life, uh, left and right and the beak of the swan heading down towards the bottom. Uh, so this one really does actually make quite a good swan shape. It lies almost along the line of the Milky Way. The band of the Milky Way passes along the neck of Cygnus the Swan. So there's lots of interesting objects in this area. And one of my favorites, which you need a medium sized telescope to find, and ideally a special filter called an oxygen filter to reveal the fine structure of this expanding shock wave called the Veil Nebula. This is where a supernova happened several thousand years ago. The star blew up and destroyed itself, probably collapsing to a neutron star or a black hole even, and has then got these uh, remains of the outer layers traveling away as a shock wave through space. In the neck of the swan, this is uh, a wolf rayet star sat in the middle of its nebula called the Crescent Nebula. This star has shed all its outer layers out into this crescent and, um, and exposed the still active and um, very, very hot core of the star that's almost entirely composed of helium. It's so big and powerful, it's forced all of the outer layers of hydrogen away from itself. It would have been a hundred times the mass of our sun and one of the most powerful stars in the sky. But these big hypergiants, as they're called, don't live very long. It won't be long before it explodes as a very powerful supernova. Just above it, at the tail of the swan, next to the bright blue star Deneb that you can see there, is the North America Nebula. And for once, it's the right way up. You can see where the dark is the Gulf of Mexico there um, with the peninsula of Central America coming down and the peninsula of Florida wrapping around. It really does look like the shape of uh, the northern uh, part of the United States and a bit of Canada down into Central America there. That's a very large object. You don't need a telescope for that. We didn't have to zoom in very far at all. And actually it's a good, good object to, if you just have a camera you can take a picture of this with a wide field uh, lens, like a 50 millimeter lens. It really doesn't need uh, a great big long focal length. Down at the other end of Cygnus, we have Albireo, which is a pair of stars that show fantastically well through a telescope, the colors of them. The bright one is orange and it's contrasted by its little neighbor, which is a bright blue star, a very, very hot star indeed. Um, and they well worth looking at. Just below the beak of the swan, we find this strange arrangement of stars, which looks like a coat hanger upside down. These stars have nothing whatever to do with each other in space. They're just a pure chance alignment in the sky that gives us the impression of a familiar household object. But they're all at different distances, so uh, it's just a perspective effect. Next to that, we have another of these dying star remnants, the Dumbbell Nebula. Right in the center, the dead white dwarf star, and the material has been shed and shot out, creating this dumbbell effect as a jet of material is zooming off north and south of the spin axes of the central star and whirling around. Very, very nice object to look at with a medium-sized telescope. 
lots of targets in Cygnus, well worth exploring. So now we're going to pull back and then move on a little bit further into the night. And I must mention that on the 11th and 12th of August, and the nights there, that after midnight, we will find a lot of meteors from the Perseid meteor shower. So if you are observing, don't uh, be surprised if you see some shooting stars coming over from the eastern side of the sky. And uh, well worth it. It's one of the best meteor showers of the whole year. There are really only two good ones. This one on the 11th and 12th of August and the Leonids that are in November. But we've moved on to the early hours now and here is Mars, the red planet. Uh, Mars is going to be a great uh, target later in the year but it's beginning to become more prominent in the sky now. Here it is with its two moons, Deimos and Phobos, they stand for fear and panic, they, uh, Mars being the god of war seems appropriate. Um, it's quite a small planet so be somewhat disappointing unless you've got a very powerful telescope but here we can zoom right in and see the red deserts and some of the darker markings and uh, really it's quite difficult to see any detail on the surface of Mars. Often you need to use the right filters try and bring the colour out and colour contrast in particular uh, otherwise all you see is a bright red dot a bit like that there. Certainly photographing it is difficult as well, even with a powerful telescope like the one I have in my observatory. Uh, but I have managed to get some reasonable images. Just next door we have the planet Uranus. A little green disc, this is what it looks like through my telescope. It's so far away I can't see very much detail on it. But I can track down uh, five of its moons, Ariel, Umbriel, Oberon, Titania and Miranda. There are other little ones like Puck and Julia that are marked there, but they're very, very faint indeed. The uh, four or five uh, is pretty much the limit for, for an amateur telescope. But it's worth tracking down just to see another planet and add it to your collection. And you'll see a sort of greenish white color to it. Um, and this is a, a high resolution zoomed in image here, revealing that it too has rings but again, they're very, very thin and not observable with amateur telescopes. So we'll pull back away from uh, Uranus and take a look at our final object on the sky tour tonight, which is over here. This is the planet Venus, the morning star at the moment. It's in the twilight, as you can see there but very, very bright indeed in the pre-dawn sky. And if we zoom in with binoculars or a powerful telescope, we'll see that it reveals a phase, rather like the moon does, with the lit side facing down, which are the direction where the sun is going to rise from, and obviously the night side opposite there. So around about half phase during this part of the month. It alternates between being visible in the morning sky which it will be for some time to come and the evening sky where it was earlier in the year April and May were a very good time for seeing it then. We'll pull back and we don't have time to uh, look at anything else on this uh, show tonight but I just will mention as we pull back away from Venus all the way back out to the widest possible view that we'll see here we go, pulling back now, just coming into the screenshot on the left there, in the orange there, there's Mercury. We'll look at that later because it's still far too far into the twilight. We'll try and catch it next month. But now that's the end of the show and we're going to let time run forward and the sun will rise up above the horizon and of course the stars will fade. So I hope you've enjoyed that whistle-stop tour of the night sky in 30 minutes from uh, sunset all the way to sunrise. You still see Venus even shining brightly now, look. So there we go. Thank you very much indeed for watching. I hope you've enjoyed that and do check out my other videos that are on YouTube. There's uh, something like 50 of them now.
all on different subjects to do with astronomy.